Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today we're joined by the head strength and conditioning coach of the Dallas Stars, Mike Donahue. Mike served as a head strength and conditioning coach for the Coachella Valley Firebirds in the American Hockey League, the 2022-2023 season. Previously spent three years with the Florida Panthers in the National Hockey League and one year with their American Hockey League affiliate, the Springfield Thunderbirds. Mike's a graduate of Springfield College where he played on the men's lacrosse team. It's a great conversation we have with Mike. We talked to him about the importance, what I call the slow bake process, what he learned at the American Hockey League level, what he learned there and how he applied those experiences in the National Hockey League. We speak to him about uh, scheduling, keeping the high days high and the low days low. We speak to him about the infancy days of coming into a new performance program with new people, new individuals, gaining the trust of players. We also speak to him about what he thinks are important in terms of measurement during the in-season. And lastly, this idea of theory versus practice. A few things that he didn't learn in a textbook that only experience will teach you. It's a fantastic episode. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. Really, uh, you know, first off, excited to be here and, and get to talk with you on this uh, chat. I know that uh, a lot of people listen to this podcast in the hockey world and the strength and conditioning world, so it's exciting and cool for me to be on here. Awesome. Looking forward to learning, spreading a, a great message to a, a larger audience, and, and uh, I know we're going to learn a ton from you today. I want to start right now with your current appointment. Recently, this past year, I hired uh, by the Dallas Stars head strength and conditioning coach, what right now are your day-to-day responsibilities with the stars? Yeah. So from a, a responsibility standpoint, I think anything that falls under the physical preparation aspect, obviously we come into the rink from a day-to-day standpoint. We meet with the coaching staff. We talk with the players. We have a plan that's made up with several different people impacting that plan and how it sort of a, a comes together. So the training aspect, the day-to-day aspect of that and then somewhat of a conduit between the nutrition aspect the sports psych aspect as well making yep. sure that players recognize that we have those resources um being new with uh, everyone on our performance staff um there is a, a learning curve that we sort of you know had to address we we took a slow play into it and made sure that guys were comfortable with us first personally um and and knew that we were there as a resource to help them and, and contribute in a way that they didn't feel like we were had a, a pressing agenda that we had to yep. put on them, but ultimately, uh, you know, sort of be a conduit to, to use the nutrition resources, to use the sports psych resources, uh, and then obviously the the training and uh, preparation aspect as well. You know, I had a, a, a chat earlier last year with Matt Price, and I talked to him about his first year hired when he was hired for the LA Kings, and he talked. I, I asked him about you know what it was when he was hired and and the challenges that were faced. But I had imagined for you coming in. How did you, you said it was a slow build. You have a, a brand new performance team this year, correct? Yeah, yeah, yep. So so pretty much from from the physical preparation standpoint, the, the team on that side is totally new. Um, there's some familiarity with the physical therapist and uh, the director is just in a new role now as a director. Yep. So he's kind of seeing it more day to day than just being yep. inside of sort of an outside, uh, you know, contractor with the team. So, you know, it's, it's totally... Uh, you know, like you sit down and you say, okay, day one, like, what, what do we want to do? How do we want to approach this? What's the current state of, of everybody's roles? What's the, what are you going to do? What are your strengths? I, I mean, it's a, it's a big learning curve for sure. And it, it ultimately comes down to, you know, just having some open conversations where yeah. you feel comfortable expressing your, your strengths, your weaknesses, like who's going to do this, who's going to do that. But ultimately, you know, it, we all had ex- relatively good experience working with people. Yep. So yep. I think ultimately it just came down to communicating what exactly the role was going to be and, and how much, um, you know, we were going to chew off for each person. What a, that's, that's interesting and unique. But I want to I want to piggyback one more question on that. You know, that, that we're fond of saying or I'm fond of saying as I've done this longer and longer, the perception of the program may be more important than the program itself. Right. Sure. How, the, the, the belief that the athlete or the player has in the program. And you said you took a slow approach, which I mean, I think is a smart thing. How did you take that approach with the players? Was it something where you just approached them and had built a relationship with them, understood their backgrounds, their histories, what they want out of certain things, 
you know, maybe you had a leadership, we call them bell cows in certain teams, mm-hmm. right? You have pick four or five leaders aside and get there. Sure. You take them out for a cup of coffee. How did you do that year one? And, and you're still in year one now, but at the onset yeah. of the hockey season. Yeah, uh, I think uh, kind of when the whole situation came out and, and I accepted the position and, and we were, you know, all on board, uh, yep. we kind of said, OK, you know, let's start reaching out to some of the players, you know, make sure that everybody in the organization knew our names, had our cell phone numbers, just some yep. of the basics, where they were, where they were training. I, I didn't really I, there was a few players that I had worked with in the past. So that was actually very helpful. I reached out awesome. to them first yep. just to get a feel for how the how the room was, what the guys have done in the past, what they like, what they don't like, and, and sort of building out that, you know, framework in my head as to, okay, you know, what, how do they value this position in the organization? And, and what does it look like? Like, what is the objectives is, am I meeting the expectations that the players have? You know, this team is a quality team with a lot of older players that have had good strength and conditioning coaches yep. in the past. So if you come in off the off the hop and it's it's not aligning, you, you're going to lose the majority of the guys, and it's hard to this right. in season to get them back. So that was the first thing, just reaching out to the guys that I was familiar with. Then I got talking to just about everybody from the AHL guys to the NHL guys. Just a simple text message: Hey, you know, this is who I am. This is my phone number. If you've got time to chat, five or ten minutes, would like to know where you're training, who you're training with. Um, being in the industry, a lot of familiar names come up, so that's nice to reach out to them. Um, obviously you've got your guys in Toronto. We have a, a lot of guys in Toronto. So the Matt Nichols, you know, you, you've got Gary Roberts. So guys, guys had some familiar faces that that was nice. And just building out that, that trust from day one and saying, Hey, you know, we're here to help. This is kind of what we're thinking. Give us a sounding board effect here. What's a good successful season for you in the gym. What's it look like from your, your body standpoint? You know, what, what are some of the things you like, you don't like, and, once you kind of talk to everybody, then it's kind of getting boots on the ground. We started, uh, you know, in the summer, I visited the facilities for the first time, checked out, you know, what upgrades we needed to make, what needed yeah. to be replaced, if we reorganized anything. Uh, some of the players, you know, stay in the summertime. So that was a yeah. great area to start working with some of those players as well. And then you get a slow in the NHL, you get a slow, tr- you know, trickle in effect of guys it's kind of starting August 1st, where, you know, four or five guys show up the next week, two more guys come in. The older guys with families are there for school, the start of school. So you slowly get to work with some of the players. And, and that's kind of where the new guys start to come in. And that's just the norm now. Like you're the new guy. These guys are already sort of working out and training with you on a day to day. You know, the, the, the sports science team is in the building. If anyone has questions, you know, we kind of hammer out the, for, the, the, the nice to meet you and how you doing early. And, and then once a training camp starts, it's obviously all business from there. Outstanding. It's a very smart approach. Uh, you have a unique background. You've been in the American Hockey League, Springfield, Coachella. Do you feel that prepared you for your current role? And I know we'll talk about, you, you know, you had a role in the National Hockey League before. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, you, you, from a player standpoint, right? A lot of times you'll hear people say the slow bake process as a player, right? Playing the American mm-hmm. League first, you, you get, you know, understand the, the professional game also, you ride the iron lung. You're not. You're not. You're not. You're not dry, flying first class. It, it gives you first, a little bit of perspective, yeah. right? Do you feel that helped you both from a programming, building trust, getting that experience, and that element to get you where you are today? Yeah, yeah. I, I think the American Hockey League is uh, a really great place where a strength and conditioning coach can have an impact and, and take on a lot of responsibilities. So. First, starting in the American Hockey League, that was my first. Um, and let me back this up just to give you some context. I, I sort sure. of uh, I, I went to Springfield College, so I was familiar with the Springfield area. Um, from there, it was great, pretty much great school, uh, my great school. That, yeah, that's all. That's out. a Hall of Famer could, right there. You got You got to get. If I can out. get, uh, if I can get a <laughs> shout out for my, my the Springfield College Mafia there, uh, uh, any any opportunity to do that, we'll we'll go ahead. That's and right. Plug the that's right. Springfield College, and um, but Pat Davidson was there. Uh, he was kind of the guy that everyone kind of rallied around he's a a very contagious individual with a a very unique approach and and a very heavy foot when it comes to exploring material and and getting other people to buy in so yep and and the grad students that were there were incredible i mean they're guys from like chris chase eric schmidt guys that were like you know coaching us in the weight room i I played college across there so i had my first strength coach was joe lawrence he's with the devils um i had sam Leahy, who was you know he's in the private sector Yep. Um, Eric Schmidt, he's in the NBA now. So guys were, you know, really trying to impress their sure. their models on our team. So 
I got good exposure from that. And, and then I started in the private sector training guys in the off season for four years. Uh, pretty much we'd bunker down for the summertime. We would train, our, our gym would train guys off ice and on ice. We had a, a, a collaborative program and ultimately sure. those things were, uh, you know, put together. So I got a taste of the off season early with some pro hockey uh, players. I was young. I was making as many mistakes as I was uh, hitting on, you know, I, I chased the PRI rabbit hole, the DNS, the, you know, you name it. We went to courses, you know, we went That's to so right. many courses. So I had that background and then getting into the American hockey league with Springfield. I remember sitting down with um, Jordy Kinnear, who was the head coach at the time. And he said, you know, what, what's your dream job? Like what during the interview process, what's your dream job? And I, I will never forget. I, I like, this is my dream job. I want to work with this team. You know, like I, I ne didn't necessarily have an aspiration to say, Hey, I wanted to be in the NHL. Uh, or coach at the NHL level. I, I just wanted to be involved with the, the hockey team in an area that I knew. So getting to the American League and getting back to the question was, you know, did it impact you? And, and for sure, you get there and you say, okay, how can I help? How can I be a service? How can I, you know, convey a, a performance message to these guys? And it's amazing at that level, you think pro athlete, you think pro hockey, and there's still a big learning curve for a lot of those guys as far as their backgrounds in, in training and preparation. So if you come in and, and I was on the younger side, I was relatable. I played a very, you know, easy to get along with approach. I, I was as friendly and outgoing as possible and and set the, the groundworks for the strength and conditioning for the season. And and having Jordy say, hey, like, is this your dream job? I'm saying, yeah, like, I'm going to work as hard as I can to to do this, fill this void that I think is here. Um, so you, you take on a lot of roles. You wear a lot of hats in the American Hockey League. You have to make a lot of decisions. Um, you're training the guys all of a sudden the, the post-game meal doesn't show up on time. They're stuck at the door. You got to somehow run and get them at the door to let them in. Because if you don't do that, the team doesn't have the food and then you can't get on the bus and you get the game the next day. So there's a lot of like yep. little things that come into play. And I think that learning curve of, you know, adjusting on the fly, being, you know, very proactive, having a couple plans in your back pocket in case, you know, yep. things hit the fan and you've got to, make an adjustment so that you learn you learn how to you know operate on the fly you do the uh, return to play prospect you know all the return to play type concepts come on your plate they ask good questions and it's sort of like your responsibility to chew what you want to chew you know if you if you want to take on a big nutrition role and, and make that really a, a priority for the guys you can do that if you want to you know take on a, a big recovery role and, and promote that you can so it's it's really sort of your space to to explore what you like so that was my first gig um, with the american hockey league and and it was a huge learning curve looking back at it uh, yep. in the moment i don't remember i don't remember being you know overwhelmed with you know it has to be right it has to be perfect it was sort of just like let's see how this rolls i have some experience with these guys in the off season so i know what that looks like and you're like what would you do in season with this schedule that somewhat prioritizes development, you know? So mm -hmm. that was kind of the difference. And then obviously the national hockey league is a, is a, another beast in a, in itself relative from a, from a preparation standpoint. Two things I thought were interesting. Your response when asked your dream job, uh, there's a book that uh, we have our interns read called make the big time where you are by frosty mm -hmm. Westerling old book. It's almost, it, you know, it's a, a Mike Boyle recommendation from years and years ago. And it reminds me of that. And we tell our young interns, like, this may not be your final destination, but what do you want me to write on your, your letter of recommendation when your experience is done here? Sure. Make that make sure. that where you are. And yeah. the other thing that you talked about, you know, you said, Anth, you know, you can bite off as much as you can chew. And I learned this, 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 and whether it's logistics for the, the team meal or whether it's programming or nutrition. And the older I've gotten in this field, I think I, I call it being a serial a specialist is where, you know, you know, lots about different pieces of the puzzle and you never dig so deep that you lose track of the landscape, if that makes sense. Sure. And I think that sure. uh, those are two really important qualities. So thanks for sharing those. Yeah. You, you were in the National Hockey League before this. OK, so 19, 2019 through 2022. Walk us through. So you're the Florida Panthers. Walk us through your first gig in the National Hockey League. Was it a, oh my gosh, I, I'm drinking water through a fire hose. I got new people. I got to, this is your first gig. Now, this is your second time through in the National League with the Stars. So what walk us through as a young coach getting that call. 
Yeah. So obviously, uh, getting back to the national hockey league was an awesome opportunity. Um, yep. it's, it's sort of a, a way where you always have that saying where like, don't let a, don't let a past opportunity affect a new opportunity and not be ready for it. So in my head, while I was in the, the national hockey league, the first time, my big thing was that I was going to take notes on everything and I was going to write down as many details and as many, you know, different things and interactions that happened so that I could recall on it. And I, I remember doing it almost like a, like a journal approach to, to the work and saying, okay, uh, this went well, this didn't went well. Uh, I like this. I don't like this. And I just started note taking. So for the first couple of years, that was my big, you know, thing that I was going to add to the, to the whole piece here. And then you get out of the national hockey league, you get to go back to the American hockey league yep. and you say, okay, well, I know what this league's about. I know how it operates. I know the players that are going to be in it. So I, I knew the re- I knew the, I knew the clientele really well. Sure. So I'm saying, okay, how can I, how can I serve these guys? And, and what's the, what's the approach? So it's so cool to come back and look while you're in it. And while you're in the national hockey league, while you're in the American hockey league, the day to day is so consuming with tasks that you, you don't really take a step out of the day to day to like, see where you are or what you're doing or, you know, is this, you don't have the time to ask, is this really the best approach or is this, do I need to change things? So you, you, when you leave, you know, you're, you're, you're getting this hindsight view of like, okay, this was awful. This was really good. This was something that I would do again, or maybe more time needs to be prioritized here. So, you know, 2019 going into that national hockey league, I'd spent one season in the American hockey league. And I thought, you know, okay, here's an opportunity. I, Florida is an unbelievable place. And, and I say that jokingly, it, it's like the environment there, the sunshine, there's something about coming off a plane in Florida, <laughs> the palm trees, like it is as beautiful as it can get. Uh, if you're an outdoor person, the, the sun is out, the palm trees, that you get the beach there. Uh, but the team really does take on the identity of the environment as well. You know, like sure. if you have a team that's in South Florida, the the uncontrollables away from the rink are, are you can be good or bad. So you know, ultimately getting down there my first season, I think that was a pretty big eye opener. It, it was like watching, you know, the, the best case scenario where the sun is shining, you've got so much good energy in the room, yep. you know, people wanted to to be outside and be active. So using that to your advantage, I thought was going to be my first, you know, thing, like, can I get the guys outside? Can I have the doors open? Can I, you know, is there a way where we can incorporate the outside into it? I think was one of the bigger things I was thinking about right off the bat. Uh, I came up with a plan. I was as prepared as I possibly could have been. And then you get there and there's still just things you didn't think about as simple as the training shoes. Like, did you, you know, get the right training shoes for the guys? And then you're like, oh my God, I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta do that. So there's a lot of things that you don't know are your roles and responsibilities. So trying to figure those out for the first year was, was a, you know, a large task that I think, you know, that was a, a huge undertaking, just figuring out the landscapes, figuring out the coaches. You know, obviously having experience in the NHL or the AHL before, you have that understanding as to the room. You could read a room. You could read a coach's room. You could see the formalities that they were trying to press. Ask good times to ask questions, bad times to ask questions. So I think I was comfortable with that aspect of it. Um, But ultimately, you know, coming up with a plan, being collaborative, incorporating other people into that plan. I think that's where the communication side I could have done a better job on, on year one for sure. And that's something that you just sort of trial and error. You, you learn as you go. And, and that was big for me. So there is no, like, once you got here, you don't get here and it's all laid out for you. You know, sure. like, it's not like, okay, here's the plan. It's like, what do you want to do? And it's from everything, every aspect. So I think that was, you know, a, kind of an eye opener for sure in the national hockey league relative to the AHL. There's way more eyes on you. There's more inputs the variety of players from an age perspective, from a demographic, like where they're, where they live, the origins, the, the Finns all, all act different than the Swedes, you know, like there's so many different varieties there too, and training backgrounds, but yet they all come together collaboratively and it sort of looks the same, you know, like it's interesting. These guys have so many different backgrounds and, and, and training backgrounds and perspectives on how they prepare for hockey. But then there's like definitely components of that that are similar. You know, so Mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that this guy's, you know, 12,000 miles or 1200 miles away. And it's, it's sort of similar, you know, so that was kind of interesting and just networking that first year was huge for me. 
Today's episode has been brought to you by Physical Preparation for Ice Hockey, Biological Principles and Practical Solutions, and again, Go Grill Manual. This is a two-part book series exploring training the intermediate and advanced level players. Book number one explores training the intermediate player. Chapters include long-term athletic development, considerations, speed training, power training, strength training, and program design. The Game Go Grow Manual explores training the high-performance hockey player. Chapters include biomechanics of ice hockey, considerations for high performers, minimizing adaptational risks while upsizing gains, the Game Go Grow model, and example microcycles. More information can be found at Amazon.com. I want to pivot slightly, but it's, it's blending in right with what you're about to talk about. I want to talk about a little bit of the programming and this management versus development, right? Managing an in-season, 82 car crashes, right? Mm-hmm. And then development, uh, you know, is the off-season. But keep the high days high and the low days low. Do you agree with that in the National Hockey League? And let me give you some context. How do you typically schedule lifts during the season? Is it immediately after a game? Is it on an off day? What is your philosophy on that? And then does it weigh heavily on feedback from the guys as well? Yeah. So uh, in the National Hockey League, the feedback from the players is is going to be there. Uh, I think how you take feedback and how you give feedback to the player is really important in that process. Sure. The players have been playing ice hockey for a long time. And I think we think about stress and imposing a stress on the team and, and what that looks like from our staff standpoint, minus the coaching staff, our department is applying stress to these guys. Like there's a physical component that we add to their week to week that in our minds, it's going to be in some value to the player. But what that also does is it also, you know, puts you in a spot where there's a lot, there's a big lens on you Mm -hmm. saying, okay, is this necessary? You know, the guys are playing this hard game. It's every other day. Is this necessary? Is it better to chase the recovery side of things? And I think the feedback from the players, you know, at times is tough because they're so caught up in the actual game that sometimes the outcomes of the game will drive and dictate the Mm -hmm. morale in the post game lifts, right? Like you got guys coming off the ice. And I always say this after our workouts, if we have a post game lift, I always say like to our, to, to the assistant here, I always say like, if we lost that game, what would that lift have looked like? Like, I don't <laughs> think we would have been able to do that. You know, yeah. like we, you know, I've had scenarios where the, the team comes off the ice. I've set up a, a bench press bar kind of jokingly. And all of a sudden guys are competing with a max bench for reps, you know, like just to yep. see like what you can do, you know, and it, And it's like, okay, well, if we don't have a positive outcome after the game, do the guys have that buy-in to to chase that? And then other times we've been in scenarios where there's a loss post-game and guys come in and they're almost like spitefully lifting because they feel like they they didn't fully, you know, deplete themselves on the ice as well. So there's definitely variables. There's definitely lenses put upon us um, when we're adding stressors week to week. But I think when we look at a week to week standpoint, we know that if we have, you know, atrophy over week to week on top of being tired, we're going to be in a a state where these guys are, are, are losing these fitness qualities that they've worked so hard to, to gain. So we like to use like kind of a basic structure when we talk about the volume that we use, you know, obviously the volume and intensity will, will be a huge conversation from a week to week standpoint. We sort of use like a a minimal adaptive volume concept or a maximum adaptive volume. Uh, And then we look at like what, would be the overshooting volumes that we see. Uh, I think when we talk about doing too much week to week and and seeing some of the the negative effects of these guys not recovering from some of their games, I think we kind of look at like how sensitive they are to the training loads. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's kind of an indicator for us as if we're doing enough, we'll see a player come in and, and this has happened before where a minimally dosed lift that I think is is not going to impede a significant soreness the next day. Like they'll come in and they'll comment, hey, I'm sore. Like I, I, sure. I'm sore. And then in my head, I'm going, oh my God, like that shouldn't be that sensitive to you. And if it is that sensitive to you, maybe we're not repeatedly exposing you to enough, right? So sure. from a week to week standpoint, those are some of the things that I think, you know, play into how that looks. 
we plan a full month ahead of time. So we get a month schedule. We know where our flights are going to be. We kind of do uh, a week to week little breakdown. How many games do we have this week? What's our travel situation? Are we crossing time zones? What is our, our predicted loads going to be? We, we use catapults for an external metric that we can kind of use for a guiding some insight into the physical attribute or physical workloads these guys are having on the ice. So we use that as well. Um, but ultimately, we're looking week to week. Where can we fit in training loads? Where can we put things that are complementary, like the keeping the highs high and the lows low, for sure is something that we, we believe in and how our approach is. We, we try to have complementary training stressors. Uh, we don't have really hard skates and then put the guys, you know, through yoga or some sort of meditation right out. Yeah. Like we, we try to be complementary to the fact that, you know, if we're going to have a, a harder work day on the ice, we we're, we kind of complement that in the gym as well, with whether it's strength work or power work as well. So that's kind of the week to week. We, we look at it from how, what's our travel like? Are we in spaces where we have access and logistically have access to training apparatuses? Do we have dumbbells? Do we have benches can we get a lift in here if we're on the road uh and then obviously at home we have a little bit more controllable from that standpoint as well it reminds me of a quote and i've 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 probably said this quote a million different times it's in a book i wrote it's from buddy morris and i'm paraphrasing and he said uh, a simple program can work wonders for both a beginner athlete and an advanced athlete but for very different reasons simple program for tommy who's built like a coat hanger you know Progressive overload, variation exposure, right? Simple program for a professional athlete with high training age who literally has 82 car crashes a year. You got to complement versus compete with the sport. And the sport being the stresses that are placed on, on the bodies of these guys, there's nothing that you're going to do to, to recreate that in the yeah. weight room. Certainly not in season. So sure. I would imagine that it's a delicate issue and, and um, you know, uh, for for a general population person who thinks soreness is a good barometer for uh, a workout in the National Hockey League, that's pretty shitty uh, a shitty measure for uh, for a workout result. Agreed. Sure, sure, <laughs> sure. And that, yeah, oh yeah, we we uh, I'll hear about it. You know, it's uh, it's a very it's almost like uh, the guys are at the edge of their seat waiting to tell you they're sore. You know, and I think some guys say it jokingly, and they're not sore just to see my response because I I get. Uh, you know, fired up when I when I hear some of the the, the, yeah. the conversations around the soreness and and the fatigue and and the game is tough. Like it is, it is a tough game, and we've got some really good metrics now um, that are still getting worked through from the league. That gives us insights to like how hard is the game for each player. Mm -hmm. You know, on time on ice, or you know, a simple plus minus is is a way to kind of see like what the game was for that individual. But now we're getting some information where the player tracking information is coming to light. You can see the velocities, the time spent at different speeds. You can see some of that information too. So you start to appreciate more, the more objective they get with the physical, you know, outputs these guys have on the ice. Uh, you definitely, you know, it, it's, it's a long game. The density of the games are not as high as you would think uh, uh, relative to a practice. The games are spread over a longer period of time. So there's definitely, you know, the intensity levels are there when guys are in a game you know they're so it's it's captivating to watch obviously on live right yep. but it's it's a fast paced game guys are making decisions they're making plays and i think when they get into the weight room and they come off the ice i think a lot of the times like it can be intimidating right so we try to we try to make it as as uh, non intimidating we try to get good music good vibes in the gym and make sure that guys want to be in there first and foremost uh and uh you know, we try to challenge players without pushing buttons too much, but we definitely are, are on the challenging side where we're, we're encouraging. It's optimistic. The music's on. You guys are wanting to be in there and, and those post game lifts, you know, are, are enjoyable for the most part. And that, and that's the first goal this first year too, as well. All right. We are going to pivot because you mentioned you're going to, we're going to parlay great, uh, very well in our next subject, which are metrics and measure and what you guys look at. Um, but I, I wanted to ask a question that's not on our sheet. Um, sure. You know, you're dealing with a team, right, from various different backgrounds. You, you mentioned the Finns, the Swedes, w w you name it, wherever. How do you deal with certain situations where maybe you have a player that says, listen, I, I, I have my own workout from my own uh, coach in Bulgaria, in Sweden, or wherever it may be. I like that workout in season. 
Is it something where you cooperate with that athlete and you allow them to have that, that, that autonomy on their program? Or is it, hey, you know, this is the Dallas Stars way. This is the way we run it run. I'm sure that's it's team specific. I'm just curious sure. as to your approach on that. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's a great question because it, every team has it. And I think sure. the insight on that is, is uh, you know, it, it's not really expressed a lot. Like you have guys that come in that, have, you know, they tie their shoes the same way every day. They they have the same strength coach they've had since they were 12. They're, they're from a, you know, a part of the map where there's not a lot of people. Like it's, these guys have their ways, right? So I, I, I'm a big fan of the allies, like of these strength coaches. I, I think send them a t-shirt, send them a hat, <laughs> make them part of the group. Like the more support we can give a player, the better. Great. And I think right off the bat, when the conversation is had, the player kind of looks at you to see like what your initial response is going to be. Is it, are you resistant to the idea of having somebody else having skin in the game here? And, and for me, I'm like accepting all allies, you know, like if you're going to contribute in a way where you are going to encourage this guy to prepare his body to play ice hockey, like who am I to be in a spot or in a position to say like, Hey, the Dallas stars do it this certain way. I, I think it's, it's a lot more cooperative. And then obviously that player then says, Oh, like, I can do this. And you're like, yeah, that's great. And if we have a good framework and we have the way our, our training is sort of set up that um, I think Chris chase is one of the guys that originally talks about, I think I've heard it from him first with like a training menu, right. Where yep. every guy has these buckets and frameworks that we utilize. And when a guy says, Hey, I've got a guy, I just like taking it down, breaking down what they're doing. So we understand what it is. And we still might then have a gap where we say, Hey, we're not really covering this specific thing let's impose a, an additional stress to that plan and then they're sure. like okay this is great like my guy is talking to your guy we're doing what i want to do so it's a little give and take and and now you you know maybe maybe you come into a scenario like we have a few guys on the team here that they've got unbelievable strength coaches that care a lot about them and want to talk to them in season and you know it, it's a huge resource for us you know like you, you learn a lot about what they what they do in the summer how they keep their bodies healthy and Big it's time. it's a good full circle, you know. Some guys for sure have their ways with it, but most of the time, when you have that approach, they they, they smile back and say, "Okay, great. Here's my guy's number. Let's get him on the phone and and figure out, you know, how this works for everybody." Hundred percent. I, I think that's probably looking back in the rear view for me personally. Probably one of the biggest mistakes I made as a young coach: this idea of rigidity in programs and maybe ego at the time. I don't know, but I know this. I, I heard this a long time ago from a great strength coach. He said, Pro, uh, coaching is a lot like parenting. At a young age, a more directive approach may be warranted. You know, like uh, I'm probably not going to get feedback from young Tommy who, who squats like a wilted candle. He just needs, you know. Sure. But having sure. said that, you know, when Tommy turns 19, 20, 21, 22, and has years past him, and I have that same approach with him, I'm, I might lose him. It's got to be more cooperative. First question we ask our guys when they come back in the summer is, hey, if we haven't seen them or if we don't know who they are, we've never, what's worked for you in the past? What do you like? Now, yeah. if it's a totally away from our philosophy, it might take us time to try to educate that person. But at the end sure. of the day, Reel them in. Reel we, them in. Yeah, <laughs> we want to mix in the, the education yeah. component with it. But gonna, I want to I want to pivot because you mentioned this stuff about, you know, catapult and metrics. And I know in my personal opinion, I think the pendulum swinging way hyper in this, 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 this realm of measure and metrics. I do, I do think certain measures and metrics are very important. My question to you is baseline testing right now in the national league. Do you feel you use that more? For example, when you come into training camp, do you use that more for baseline for return to plays? Do you learn it to, 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 to address and measure fatigue readiness or, you know, what do you use it for? And if, if you're able to share what you focus in on, that would be great as well. If not, certainly understand. Sure. Yeah, I, I can uh, give some insights. Obviously, the conversation could go on for yep. hours with yep. what we're looking at. Um, you know, from our standpoint, we have an internal metric. We use heart rates. We have a polar uh, heart rate system. Catapult does some external loads as well. Those are some of the things. We have a Hawkins force plate as well. So those are some of the tech components that we've kind of added into our piece here. Uh, we also have staff to use those devices. Um, sure. A lot of times, you know, people add some of these things and then don't realize the oh, the amount they, of time and effort that need to go yeah, into them. You real, know? real quick, I got, I got, I got to interject, but it, it it is so true, right? Like the the collecting data part. That's the easy part. It's yeah. it's it's what you do and and, yeah. and what you do with those numbers, how you analyze them, and how you make decisions. That takes time. 
Sure. Sorry. Sure. And, and it, it takes time and it, and it, it takes, you know, you, you then are, are you looking to use it for actionable decisions? Because then there's a time component to your decision-making and analysis too. And, you know, next thing you know, you, you've got so much on your plate that you're, you can't even, you theoretically believe that this is going to impact your, your plan, but then you go back to the plan and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to change anything. And we've done all this. We, I don't know if we have a, a thorough enough lens. So, so sometimes that's, uh, you know, the reality of, of some of these, some of these components, you know, I, I think from an assessment standpoint, the, the big thing that we're looking at is the simplified versions, the things that are low skill for these guys to do. So, you know, the isometric strength testing, body weights, body compositions, things that are very objective for us to understand, I think are great resources for us to use right off the bat that are pretty like, you don't really get to you know, there's no dispute, right? Like it's, yep. it's very simple. And, and, you know, we used to use the just jump mat all the time and guys, I can remember guys, you know, trying to game the test where they're, they're, they're doing the little salmon jump at the top and yep. they're tucking yep. their feet to try to get as much airtime as possible to, to do it. Right. So like there's a constant level of, of skill that's required when you're doing these assessments. And if it's not repeatable, you're getting a snapshot of a very different thing at times. So being really critical on that aspect, if we're going to test something, it has to have the ability to be repeated. There's a practical application there and there's a bandwidth that I think is, is good enough in that setting. Um, it's not going to be perfect with the amount of athletes we see, um, you know, that we have to get through on our team from a day-to-day standpoint. It's not perfect, but I think it definitely helps when you have some standard approaches to it. The protocols are similar. You know, so if you're going to do, if we're going to do force plate testing, we have them set up, we can capture the information pretty quickly in the training session. uh, And then we can go back and look, but if we don't, you know, set up a good testing protocol with it, when we go back and look at it, the strategies that guys were using are are so varied and you got so many different, you know, jumping styles that now you're like, okay, did the jumps even give us the information we're looking at? Or are we just seeing totally different strategies amongst the team? Right? Sure. Well, it's interesting. There's a lot. There's a lot to, to chew on there, um, and I think a lot of times, this is just my opinion. Uh, Dan Paff calls it the academic drip. I think a lot of the time with the technologies and certainly some of the research, you know, we're creating problems coaches don't even know existed. Like yeah. you know, you you can yeah. you can spend a day on a jump, like literally a day, and the question is, okay, what's important, what's not important when you have 70 different metrics to choose from, how, you know, if you're focusing on one, is it the expense of the others? There's just a lot of unanswered questions. I do think it objectifies certain things if you focus on certain variables, but I think it can be cloudy as well. Regarding those metrics, do you use those in the return to play process? If so, you know, for example, do you use the Hawkins to measure whether it's asymmetry index? Do you use the catapult to understand, hey, what's a normal game load? We got to slowly bring this guy back uh, from his MCL to X percent of that game load. Are you using that objective information to steer the ship coupled with your subjective feedback, both from performance coaches, skill coaches, and, and head coaches? Yeah, yeah. So on the return to play side of things, you know, one of the main benefits is having uh, a physical therapist amongst our group that's that's very physical. Like his his... He trains himself. He, he's he's very competent in the the physical training that comes with physical therapy. Um, so we're lucky to have him as a resource here as well. And and with the with the testing parameters that we set from training camp, we do utilize those from a return to play baseline to say, okay, this is the workload. If we're on ice, what was the actual physical output on the ice? So from a player's load pers- player load perspective, with catapult, are we using you know? Hey, this is what we'd like to see. This is sort of our range. We express that with a skills coach or a skating coach to explain to them, you know, what the limitations are, what we'd like to see as far as the loads go. And then we also give the autonomy for that coach to to still coach, you know, like it it's sometimes they get they get paralyzed because you're saying, okay, do this, don't do this, don't do this. We really would try to make sure that that's a delicate conversation that sets them up to have success with their protocols and their needs as well. Uh, and then, you know, we're, we're using it to, to slightly guide that process and, and confirm or deny if what we're doing is working. Right. You know, sure. I think that's another aspect. Sometimes 
we can just rule out if it's not working or if something's not improving, then I think that's just as valuable information as if something is improving, right? So they definitely help us for sure. And because they're, they're objective, you know, the, the body weight, I, I think gets overlooked sometimes that we'll see guys in the National Hockey League who are injured and their delayed activities from the start. Maybe they gain some body weight. Maybe their body fat goes up. They repair the tissues repair their skating, but now they're, you know, physically they're outside of the parameters or the fitness standards that we have for those individuals. And that's an additional injury, you know, like that yep. can be just as detrimental to their performance. So now you say, okay, we're going to, the team says, okay, we're going to pull this individual back of, off of long-term IR. And yet they're still not in their physical parameters of readiness. So I think that's another component that allows us to make that, you know, conversation, have that conversation with the training staff, the medical team as well, and say, hey, you know, we, we, we also have uh, circumference me measurements of their quads. If there's a lower extremity issue and we've got some sort of atrophy of a leg, like it's important for us to know what that looks like. If they, you know, can't walk for a week, that quad atrophy is like crazy. And sometimes it's just transient fluid, which is fine. But if it's a long-term chronic injury, now maybe we're in a spot where we have to you know, make sure we're addressing that. And is the nutritional intervention aligning with the physical interventions? And, you know, is he, you know, fully bought into that, that whole process? So a lot of those baselines, the more objective we can be, the better. The measurements of it are great. We definitely use them to help guide that decision making and, and, and just have a good conversation with everybody with, with that information. Conversation. I want to get time for a few more. I want to respect the fact that it is game day today. How do you communicate? Is it a need to know, or you know, I, I, I'm guessing this is really dependent on head coach. For example, you know, uh, player load. Let's hypothetically say you you monitor that. Is that something that coaches a care about? And when I say care about, meaning like you send a, a detailed report just to get an idea, or are there are certain situations where it's like only when it's been asked opinion wise, or uh, if there's a crucial moment uh, it, during the course of the season where it's a need to know basis, how do you communicate that? And then the same question would be to the players. It's, is it something where, you know, you're looking at a, you know, a player card at the end of the year or, you know, where you're at in terms of KPIs, et cetera. Yeah. The, the feedback is absolutely critical with the coaching staff and obviously the player side of it. You know, I think it can be a very intimidating conversation at times when, there's not a lot of information given. There's too much information given to a coach where they then get overwhelmed with it. And, you know, it's, it's hard to find something you're not looking for, you know, like it's, yeah. they, they're, they're not aware of it. So I think from an education standpoint, we start in the beginning of the season and express, Hey, this is something we're going to be doing. This is what we're looking at. These are the variables that we're, we're, we're calculating on the backside of things. You guys proceed with what you think is appropriate from a day to day standpoint. If there's a scenario where we see, you know, trends in some direction or another that we think are valid conversations, we'll pull you aside and, and give you those. Uh, if there's, you know, questions that you have from a day to day standpoint, obviously, as the resources grow for the Dallas Stars, we, we can have those discussions. Uh, but I don't think we we don't come running in running down the hallway with, you know, the, the paper saying you got to <laughs> see the player load, you got to see the player load, you know, we, we don't run down the hallway shouting the numbers. Uh, sometimes, even from a player's perspective, keeping it, you know, very simple and they can get caught up in the numbers sometimes. So making sure that it's not, we're not overweighting that information, but we're also, you know, if there's something that's to point that we need to, to show, we're, we have the ability to, to bring that up pretty quickly. Great. Final pivot here. Uh, you've been in the National League now with two different teams. You're in the American League. You've had a, 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 a diverse and broad background in the game of hockey. Right now, what do you view, if any, current gaps in holistic care for the players in general based on, you know, we talk about this high performance model, which is a sexy term nowadays, but sure. do, you, do you view any gaps in that right now at the moment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know if I would call them gaps per se. What, what's fascinating to me with today's game is how in tune some of the younger players are with high performance concepts. So, you know, as simple, you know, guys come in and they say, hey, like I got this, this lotion that has no parabens and, and you're saying, okay, well, why does this have like a high performance side to it? Well, I'm working with this nutritionist. I've got this dialed in. 
I'm working with this person on this. And then all of a sudden they're like down the rabbit hole enough where like the soaps and deodorants that they put in their bodies, they're like consciously choosing brands that don't have these, these, you know, chemicals that are harsh to their skin. Right. So I think it's interesting to see like that. Mike, what the, hell's a so par- what the hell's a paraben? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just joking, exactly. I, I'm, but I'm serious. Exactly. I, I, I'm gonna have exactly. to Google that one. <laughs> exactly. So it's like it's one of those ones where these guys have like some of these guys are down these rabbit holes, and then some of it's warranted. You know, like some yep. of these guys have have stored up a lot of the holes that yep. now that's the level of, of degree in which they're at. Other guys are still like side of, sort of the meat and potato. They like to work hard. They want to get after it. Less information is more information you know, just stop the puck or just make a play or just do do the little things on the ice. And that's my job. And that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, whatever workout you put up for me, I'm going to hit that workout as hard as I can. I think from a gap standpoint, you definitely have um, communication is probably like the biggest thing that always comes up is like the information is sort of there. Now, is it being applied? You know, like there's some people that have good information and good, good, good information that I think would help some of our guys that maybe isn't, you know, fully adopted yet or in play but i think that's probably you know from a holistic standpoint you you see guys taking care of their bodies on the road you know we do optional stretches at the hotel like a wind down stretch that we'll provide guys at times it's optional for for players that want to do it and it just adds adds to a layer for sure of um you know how how serious guys have gone down some of these rabbit holes as far as taking care of their bodies last question here uh, theory versus application. My opinion, I, I think, again, uh, I don't know if it's heavily influenced by my mentors, the academic drip. I, I feel that as a, as a performance uh, group, the islands between academia and theory are growing larger and larger to the actual application. That's my personal opinion. My One of my favorite quotes in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. I, that was Yogi Berra's. Sure. Last question, applied versus practical. You know, you've you got an educational background. You also have a pragmatic one. What are one to two things they didn't teach in a book about your current position? You know, like one or two things is like if you get something right at this level, the chance of you getting it right because of it being the plan, I think is so rare <laughs> that if you think you got it right and you think that the plan was executed and you're you got it right because of that, I think that is like, you know, not correct these guys have such a small window here right of adaptability and to think that within that small window your perfect plan executed perfectly you know i think from a from a textbook standpoint or or reading the application like i think in pro sports you get that perspective of okay the window is so small i'm going to impose this thing on a such a small and like even moving the needle here like you you hear that, that moving the needle it's like to do that is so challenging and if you do get it right by chance you know it's by chance it's not you know there's there's definitely you can hedge a bet and you can bet on yourself and you you can try to come up with plans and scheme for everything but i think in a textbook standpoint the application versus you know the the academic side and, and and seeing the bridge between the two like there is so many different ways that these guys will demonstrate elite level quality of physical outputs it's it's so it's so varied um that i think if you do get it right and if it all does align it i think a lot of times you you realize how rare that is for that all to happen you know you you try stuff and it doesn't work and you don't get that opportunity there's so many people online that think they have all these answers because (laughs) you know it's so easy you know like this is yeah you know it's so simple but i think that's something as you get older and you get more experience i think that comes to light more and more Our guest today has been Mike Donahue. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. 